Lord my God, soft as a whisper, when I'm in awesome wonder, consider all the words thy hands has made. Lift up your hand. I see the stars. seated. Wow, we're just amazing. We're looking forward to the next week's anointing prayer. It's got to be awesome, man. <laughs> just amazing sense of his presence. Okay, just a couple of highlights. Uh, pray, so the communion, continue every Wednesday, uh, 1 to 2, and after that, we're going to be intensive intercession for you, all right? And uh, we go into groaning, go into uh, really intercession. I've never seen before, okay? Okay, we can have a celebration night on uh, July 26, two weeks from now. All right, it's a good time for celebration, testimonies, and great outreach uh, uh, possibilities and opportunities. So invite your friends to come. Get your invitation card from the resource center. Okay, and um, uh, amazing testimonies. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, a miracle rally. I believe there's going to be even a, a astounding testimony come out of it. Invite your friends to come for this miracle rally and uh, mission trip. Uh, 20 to 25th of November, three weeks from now, we're going to go to the Philippine minister to uh, two groups of pastors. They said about a thousand strong. Uh, yeah, I'd like to talk to a pastor because one pastor I touch, I can touch perhaps a couple of hundred people. So the eff effectiveness is being multiplied. So do keep us in prayer before, during, and after the mission trip. And give you the opportunity to fill up the uh, commitment card later on. Okay? Uh, yeah, wonderful Jesus, and uh, watch this testimony. Journey with God. Dear Pastor Joshua, the facilitators imparted the words to us with deep confidence, God's unconditional love. All lessons were very touching, and I could feel so much appreciation, so appreciated by God. The audio sent a week earlier was helpful for me to prepare for the coming lesson. I cherish every word in all the lessons, glowing with his resurrection power. I am overwhelmed, and it spurs me to share the gospel at least with one person a week and invite them to church to get them saved. Kingdom Dynamics taught me to stay focused and to flourish in my journey with God, to be conscious of him, and at the same time, enrich my quiet time with him. The word reminded me that I am not alone in my challenges. The agape meal was a brilliant idea. Our class had home-cooked meals. I was delighted when it was our group's turn to cook. The agape meal gives us time to fellowship with others. It is exciting, like following the book of Acts. The Kingdom Dynamics classes showed I am God's masterpiece and what God has done for me at the cross. It was wonderful to be appreciated by all. Thank you, Pastor Joshua, for preparing the Kingdom Dynamics book. Praise the Lord. Let's give God a Amen. half offering. Okay, um, Psalm 65, uh, verse 9 is the Sunday manner today. 
You take care of the earth and water it, making it rich and fertile. How many of us know that God is the one that watches over us? And other people say, say the river of God has plenty of water, not tight budgeted, but plenty. It provides a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have added it so. How many of us know that means is a commanded blessing? Say that doesn't right. It's commanded blessing. It's decreed, not just by the earthly king, but by the king of kings. Verse 11, and you crown the year with a bountiful harvest, even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. Maybe you're struggling with your work for months, and you say, man, what I'm, what's happening to me? The Bible tells us even the hard pathway, difficult challenges, disappointing situation, colleagues and friends that disappointed you, Man, even in the hard pathway, God says it's going to overflow with abundance because God has ordered it so, and other people say, Amen. Let's take the offering even right now. Father, thank you for this beautiful morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, rebuke and bind every foul, wicked, evil spirit. Can you go from here right now in Jesus' name that your word may have free course in the midst of us, and other people say, we continue our studies on Psalms 23, and today, finally, we come to verse 4. It goes like this, Psalm 23, verse 4. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They will say, yeah, even though I walk through the valleys of the shadow of death. How many know that valley is very much part of life, okay? This lady was complaining to the Lord. Lord, I don't know why today there's so much frustrating situation. Everything seemed to go wrong. Get up um, late because the alarm didn't ring. I was late to work and ordered a sandwich. It came the wrong sandwich. And uh, by the time I changed one, uh, the lunchtime was over. Got to start work. Uh, meeting, meeting, meeting. And on the way back, I was talking with a friend. The cell phone dropped. I was cut short in the conversation. Reach home and put on a master's chair, but it didn't work. God, why? All this frustrating thing, everything to go wrong. And God say, okay, let me go through the events today with you. The alarm didn't ring because I know you're going to meet me in an accident because there's going to be a drunken driver going to hit you. And uh, you're delayed because I kept you from the disaster. And the sandwich was sent back because I know there was a piece of glass in that sandwich. And the phone dropped because that guy is going to pollute you, pollute your mind with all the gossip and rob you of God's blessing in your life. And when you reach home, the uh, massager didn't work well uh, because the fuel is blown. If you're on it and it works, you're going to blow the whole house down and the whole night you're going to be in darkness. Would you like to spend the whole night in darkness? How many of us know that there's always a purpose? We heard so many testimonies of uh, people escaping from the disaster in 911 because there was a traffic delay. They didn't manage to catch the plane. And at that point in time, they were frustrated. But later on, they say, ha, ah, praise God for the delay. And the kidding is, how many of us know the valleys in our life are real? It says here, the valley of the shadow of death. Look up, it's a real valley. It's not just a descriptive term. And I, I believe David must have walked through this valley so many times. It's a valley that is dark most of the time. The sun only hits the bottom at noon time. That means it's going to be dark 23 hours a day. It's really the valley of the shadow of that. And all kinds of valleys that we experience, frightening one, there was this guy who was trying to take a shortcut, pass through the cemeteries. Because after a late night a party, so man, it's going to take a shortcut. While he was walking, he heard a chipping sound. Chip, chip, chip. So he was frozen in fear. So he saw a guy... Uh, who was chipping his way at the tombstone, he came over to him, ah, it is you. He breathed a sign of relief. I thought it was a ghost. And he said, why, why are you chipping your way at the tombstone? In the middle of the night, the guy replied, those fools misspelled my name. <laughs> I've you gone through this kind of a valley. Huh? But the Bible tells us that because God is with us, the shepherd is with us, his rod and his staff, they comfort us. In other words, we can go through the valleys in our life, or the frustrating situation, or the stress, or the problem, in style, in comfort. I want to tell you from this particular psalm, Psalm 23, verse 4, how we can really go through, walk through the valley in style. Number one, you've got to realize that 
you are only walking through the valley. You're not going to be there. How many of us know that all the valleys that you encounter are temporal? The person, you know, but my loved one gone on to be with the Lord. Yeah, I, I think it's disappointing. I will never be able to fully comprehend the pain you feel. But one thing, the fact is that that loved one of yours that have gone on ahead of you is in perfect bliss. He has passed through. It is it's a setback, but we know for sure. It's what uh, Paul testified in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us as a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Wow. This light, Paul said, light momentary affliction. And Paul, is that the one has gone through much in his life, all right? In prison, flock, shipwreck. And yet he said, all oh, this are light. It's because in comparison to eternity, he says, light affliction is but a moment, but it's working for us, eternal weight of glory. Just like perhaps I can imagine Joseph must be wondering, what well, I'm going through 13 years as a slave and in prison, but right now he looked back and said, hey, that 13 years is just by a twinkling of the eye, just a second. And when you go through the miserable situation in your life, you felt it's like time has frozen. But the fact, the truth remains that you are just passing through. That's why David said, even though I walk through, and he has been through that valley many, many times. And uh, Hamra must know that valley is very much part of life. Frustrating situation, difficult challenges, and uh, life would have been rather boring. How many of you have driven on the prairie before where grassland, miles and miles of road is straight? Man, you doze off quite easily. But when it bends, like Cameron Highlands, uh, you, I think you'll never fall asleep because of the up and down, the valleys and the curve. How many of that? that God allows valleys sometimes. And why do you think that valleys are part of life? There could be two reasons, perhaps more. Number one, we're living in an imperfect world, and also we ourselves are not perfect. And number one, we're living in an imperfect world. This is the reason why for the valleys in our life. John 16 says, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. He didn't say you may, but you will. There's going to be stress, going to be disappointment situation, pressure, rejection, even on your loved one, people that you don't expect. The fact and the truth is that even Jesus Christ experienced valley. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Some of you in the Holy Land, you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, you know it is a valley. And in that valley, Jesus Christ asked the disciples to pray for him but they were frozen in sleep. I could imagine Jesus could have been very disappointed. Maybe he would throw in the towel and say, give up, I resign as savior. No, how many know Jesus didn't give up because he realized that this is the world that he came to serve. And very often, wellies are unexpected. You don't plan for the misery or the frustrating situation. I remember uh, we had on a speaking engagement to Christ Church in Malacca, one of the perhaps the oldest church built during the time of the uh, Dutch in Malacca. And uh, you remember that is a time where Lydia, a little girl, operated in the world of knowledge. Say, Auntie, you have a summer egg? And Auntie was very surprised in the car, sitting at the back of the car. And he said, How do you know? God told me, I want to pray for you. And Lydia prayed for that lady and she was healed. But on the way back, I was driving my uh, car on the highway. There was a stone hit our windscreen and it shattered uh, the glass. And so we got to pull to the side of the road, remove the broken pieces. And uh, the rest of the time, we were driving back to Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> and you know what? The only one that enjoyed the trip is Lois and Lydia because they're little kids. They don't mind. They're happy as can be. The wind blowing. And sometimes we go through frustrating situations. I remember one time. I was in Finland. I didn't know uh, what happened until I come back. They told me the time uh, Lois was in primary one. Uh, Pastor Kerry reminded me, it was in standard one. Standard one, about seven years of age, and she was studying in Asunta school. For some reason, the, the school bus took off without her. And she was, didn't know what to do, but the Lord reminded her that she has uh, an auntie all right, working across in Asunta hospital. And she walked across, she didn't know which department, in the end, she found Auntie Julie. And can you imagine, things could have happened. And 
I was totally ignorant of it. And the staff didn't want to tell me because they didn't want us to be worried when we were on a mission trip. Those are good staff, all right? They're not going to tell me all kind of stuff that I can't even concentrate. And how many of sometimes ignorance is bliss? And the way back from mission trip in Taiwan, came back, my car, I saw a puddle of oil at the bottom. It's the leakage from the oil uh, from the, the gear. And the mechanic attending to the car said, in all these years, I never experienced such kind of phenomena, uh, leaking oil like this. It was a very old Volvo 240D, that many, many years ago. Hammer must know that sometimes other things are not planned. But Hammer must know God is in control. He is a fixer of all those imperfect situations. The way he fixed Joseph's problem. Remember, his brother threw him to the pit? Yeah, he got into prison. Yeah, he was falsely accused. But cut the story short, he became the prime minister of the world empire of his day. He testified to his brother that you plotted evil against me, but God turned it into good to preserve life. And uh, Hamram was though, God is in control. Even in an imperfect situation, Psalm 65, verse 11. You crown the year with a bountiful harvest. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. Wow, <laughs> even the hard, difficult situation, God says it could overflow with abundance. And so we have rallies, unexpected challenges. This is because this world is imperfect, all right? Number two, you are also imperfect. I heard a story of this particular printer was asked to print a wedding card. All right, supposed to write 1 John 4.18, but accidentally he printed John 4.18. So, Pastor, what's the problem? Well, 1 John 4.18 says there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all fear. But the printer accidentally missed out first. So instead of 1 John, it becomes John 4.18. It goes like this. You have five husbands, the one you're living with, not even your husband. That never makes them really ugly choices, shameful choices. The printer don't know where to put his head, right? And David says he has gone through the valley, and the reason why he walked through the valley is because he come a point in time where his focus is not on God anymore, but on self. In Psalm 23, the first three verses, it goes like this. He's a, my shepherd, I will not want. He lead me lie down. He leads me in quiet places. He restored my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. He, 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 he. But then in the valley, even though I walk through <laughs> the valley of the shadow of death, there come a point in life where the focus of David is no longer on the shepherd and is on self. And the reason why we got ourselves in trouble, not every valley is because of our own bad choices. Sometimes it's because of the bad choices of others because we're living in an imperfect world. Sometimes we end up in our valley is because we focus on self. That is the cause of misery. Make bad choices, ugly choices, but I have good news for you. Despite your bad choices, God is for you. It goes like this. Even though I, remember, I, uh, the focus from he to I, if the I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. In other words, even if you make bad choices, how many of us know that God, your shepherd, is still with you, despite the bad choices? As a matter of fact, Luke chapter 15 tells us that the good shepherd left the 99 <laughs> good sheep and go after the one <laughs> that wandered off. Man, you know, I made some bad choices. I don't think I'm worthy of God's grace. Let me tell you this. The good shepherd left the 99 good one and gave special attention for the one who wandered off. Hey, Pastor, I made a bad choice. You just become God's focus and object of his love and the focus of his special attention, and other people say, Amen. And the, the most important thing is that all right, when you make a bad choice, let God sort things out for you. Say it together with me. Shout it out. Let God sort things out for you. Don't try human ways. Now, you got into the valley. is because of I. But you're not going to come out of the valley because of I. All right, you got to go back to the shepherd. Allow the good shepherd come 
and sort things out for yourself. Also, how do I let God come into my life and sort things out for me? <laughs> Number one, don't give excuses for why you go, got yourself into the valley. Don't blame others. The more you focus on excuses, the more you blame others, you blame your father, you blame your mother, you blame everybody, and blame your boss, blame the weather, you blame everybody. You know why? It's still a focus on self. The more you blame, the more you focus on self. You try to justify yourself. What you need to do is that when you make a bad choice, don't be filled with guilt and condemnation. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, there is now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So don't dwell in the past, don't dwell in guilt and condemnation. The past, I made a bad choice, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have done that. No. <laughs> learn whatever you can learn. Say, learn whatever you can learn. And move on. The most important thing is, when you make a bad choice, don't resort to self-effort. Pastor, I make a mess of my life. I got to sort it out. I got to get it in. No, the more you try to sort things yourself, the more mess you're going to be in. You need to let the shepherd sort things for you. What happened to Judas? Remember, he betrayed Jesus, and he got those pieces of silver, and he tried to give it back to the high priest. The high priest would not take it, and he threw it into the valley of hell, Gehenna, and he hung himself. You know what happened? Judas tried to sort things himself, human way. He even just waited for a couple of hours. He even realized he doesn't have to hang himself because somebody else, Jesus Christ, is going to be hung for his sin and other people say. So when you're in your valley, you got it in because of I, don't come out by your own human effort. You're going to make a mess, more mess. You're going to focus on God. Even though I walk through the valley, you are with me. Focus on the good shepherd. But so what must I do then? Because I'm making a mess. I've got to do something. Yeah, it's still self-effort. Galatians 3 says, those who are of the work of the law is under a curse. In other words, those who rely on human effort to fulfill God's requirement are going to be under a curse. The Mosaic law. You know what? Let the shepherd, the good shepherd, sort things out for you. But so what must I do? <laughs> well, Luke chapter 15 says, there's more joy in heaven for one that repent than so many. Now, what did the sheep do in terms of repentance? You know what? All that the sheep did in terms of repentance is consent to be carried by the good shepherd. There's nothing the sheep can do. The more the sheep struggle, the more mess, the more deep in the pit he's going to be in. Just allow himself to be carried on the shoulder of the good shepherd. And man, he's going to be on his way home. And other people say, kidding is, God is for you despite the mess. But let him sort things out for you. And other people say, Amen. number two. So how do we get across the valley, walk through the valley in comfort? Realize you're passing through. You're not alone. It's not self. It's a shepherd. All right, he's for you. He will sort things out for you. Number two, why we can get comfort in the midst of our journey in the valley? Number two, it's because that valley is only by the shadow. It is called the valley of the shadow of death. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, shadows a little while. Three things about shadow. Number one, how many must know shadows cannot hurt you? How many of you have been bitten by the shadow of a dog? A lot of worries. I, and as I said, I remember uh, early days, uh, one of my trips. In those days, the passport got to be stamped. Nowadays, it's all electronic. You don't have the stamp passport. But those days, you got to stamp. So I was in that trip, and I noticed my passport was not stamped. I compared my passport with others. And they all are stamped, so I got worried. If only I have reminded the custom officer, if only stamp on it. What if? What if when I exit the country, the guy said, you never enter the country legally, and I got stranded, I cannot come back to preach. I was worried the whole time in the trip. And when I exited the country, nothing happened. I remember though, that worry is unnecessary. Let me say, 99.9 <laughs> cases of your worry, I remember know, it is not necessary. Okay, so number one, Shadows can never hurt you. But number two, shadows makes things bigger, appears bigger. That's why Psalm 64 verse 1 says, 
Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. You know, this is that the writer of the psalm didn't say, Lord, deliver me from my enemy. Because he knows the enemy has no power over him. You know what he prayed? Lord, deliver me from the fear of the enemy. Yeah, the shadows are not real, but the effect is real. I think it was President Roosevelt that said this in his famous inaugural address. He said, the greatest thing that you need to fear is fear itself. Remember during the Iraqi war when Saddam Hussein shoot 39 Scud missile at the Holy Land? So Pastor White, 39. Well, I guess uh, because Jesus Christ was given 39 lashes and uh, extensive damage, but not one single life was killed. So the pastor, I thought it was one. Yeah, one. But it was not killed because of the Scud missile. It's killed because of fear. He died of a heart attack. The fear of the Scud, not the Scud. How many of us know that um, the shadow cannot hurt, but the effect can hurt. All right, just a doctor tells today that one of the leading causes of diseases is stress. But the other diseases can actually <laughs> cause us problem. Not arthritis. I call it what if itis. Also, what if I fail my examination? What if I didn't get the right school? What if my husband is unfaithful? Also, what if I'm retrenched? Pastor, what if I get cancer? Some time ago in the country down south, the leader of the country said, one in three of their folks over 60 years of age, you will get diabetes. All right, you've been over 60, one in three chances. And so some friends that I know started to steer from carbohydrates to protein, meat, and oil. And then some time ago, there was a medical authority, leading one, that said eating one meat a day raise a chance of contacting diabetes by 20%. Man, one time frozen in fear because of a carbohydrate, now frozen in fear because of protein. Man, come on, rest in the Lord and other people say, follow the Bible diet. And what is the Bible diet? Two meals a day. <laughs> uh, Elijah diet, right? The crow brought meat in the morning and the night, and then the, the manna come in the morning and night. So just at rest, enjoy what God has provided for you. Uh, in a moderate way, in other people say. Another disease, you gotta watch out for, not just stress, is if only itis. Say, if only itis. If only I can turn back the clock. If only I made the right choice. Pastor, if, I, if only I work harder to earn the degree. Pastor, if only I marry Lechmi or Afa. Pastor, if only I spend more time with my family. Of course, we, we gotta learn whatever. Thing that we got to learn. How many months? The past is past. Say to me, the past is past. Don't feed your history. Feed your destiny. And other people say, no, sometimes we are hit with all kinds of setbacks. We felt it, life is finished for us. We lost our fire. We lost our dream. And we think that, yeah, I got to be condemned to live a life of mediocrity. We lost our dream. We lost our fire. I guess this is what happened to Moses. Remember, he made a bad choice. He ran for his life, and he was at the backside of the desert for 40 years. It looks like everything is washed up, dream is gone, but one day, he got an encounter with God. He saw a tree on fire, but the fire was not burned. I believe it dawned upon him, yes, there may be affliction, maybe there are challenges, but the challenges, the affliction, can never burn off God's dream in your life. And that dream rekindled, that fire rekindled. You may give up on your dream. How many must know God never give up on your dream? And other people say, it's a new day. Get the fire back. And other people say, amen. amen. Just because you give up on your dream does not mean that God give up on yours. Because he's a good shepherd. So the shadows cannot hurt you, but it can be real. You will allow it to dominate your life. Three, the third thing about shadow is that shadows show that there is light. How many have seen a shadow without light? When you see a shadow, that means there must be what? Light. All right, the presence of a shadow guarantees there is a light. That brings us to the third point, that shadow points us that there is a light. And of course, we know that it is God. All right, your good shepherd is with you even in the darkest valley. The writer of the psalm says, I fear no evil, for you are with me. One of the things we know that when the 
valley. You don't, we don't have to sort things out ourselves, our way, and up more messy. Let the shepherd sort things out for you because he is your good shepherd. I am with you. His presence. Notice that God didn't just promise you his power. He promised you his presence. You know, there was this professor in those days in the Soviet Union. I was talking about evolution. There's no God, everything is there, and uh, survival, the fetus, and natural selection. And then on and on, there's no God, everything is just evolution. The young boy asked him, Professor, um, if there is no God, how come sheep survive? The sheep is the most stupid animals. There is no sense, there is no sense of direction, lost is lost, gotta get back. Uh, the sheep has no power, no strong teeth, no muscle, cannot run, no speed. But in some countries like New Zealand, there are more sheep than men. And but look at all those powerful animals. The, the biggest land animal, the elephant with its strong teeth, is hunted almost to extinction. The rhinoceros with a strong horn is hunted almost to extinction. The tigers and the lions were all hunted almost to extinction. Professor, if there is no God, how come sheep survive? And not just survive, but thrive. And the professor, oh, you're because of the shepherd? <laughs> then the boy said, yeah. How do I know God is alive? Because of his care, his personal care in our lives and all the people say, amen. amen. And because of the shepherd, you know he's there. It's for you. He comes with his rod. <laughs> That's what I fear, rod. Sometimes we got the rod, we think, that, man, when you did the wrong thing, he come whack you. I look up. <laughs> Uh, this is a typical rod. Oh, man, the shepherd gets up. Some preacher preach like that. You serve the internet, all kind of teachings. All right. Oh, man, you make the bad choice. Uh, the good shepherd will come and whack, uh, whack. <laughs> How many of us know? Um, if you want to understand a passage of the Bible that you don't understand, you've got to refer to another passage that will interpret the biblical passage you don't understand. The word rod, sebel, in the Hebrew, occurs also in Michael 7.14. Look at how it's being translated and how it's being used in Michael 7.14. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as is in the days of old. Now what is the use of the rod? Sebel? It is for feeding. Say feeding. So when we make a bad choice, God is not going to come with the rod and whack us. And, and, and I told you so. You should have done this. You should listen to me. No, he come. He feed us. This is exactly what happened. Remember the disciples forsook him. They went fishing. They couldn't make any catch. No catch. And the master stood at the shore and said, Friends, have you got any catch? No catch. And they know it's Jesus. They put the shore with a huge catch. Up the, they put the net on the right side. By the time they reached the shore, then they encounter the good shepherd like they never expected. Bread, fresh bread and fresh fish was prepared for them on a live coal. They got warm chapati. All right? And they got warm uh, grilled ikan pulus or maybe St. Peter's fish. And Jesus fed them. And after that, lift them up to what that can be. How many must know that's what the good shepherd will do? And other people say, and uh, that rod is also a weapon to protect the sheep. David knows it because sometimes the lion will come, the bear will come. That rod is not to beat up the sheep. Because they are so stupid, the more you beat, the, the joker may not even understand what you're saying. That, that rod is for the lions and the bear and the snakes that come to attack the sheep. Put it this way, if, if the truth is being known, how many must know that you realize that God has been protecting you in more ways than you can ever imagine. Now, uh, the story, the real story of this pastor, very famous pastor, it was in his little plane, all right? As usual, pastor would always spend uh, time in a plane trying to write sermons. He tried to pull down the tray to write something, but no matter how he tried to pull the tray down, couldn't. So he get his friend across the aisle and come try to pull down the tray, couldn't, until they got exhausted, give up, 
and the pastor sit down, look up, saw on the window a signboard that saying, emergency lever don't pull. I can imagine if they, he has pulled down the, the lever, the door would have opened, you know, the, it's, it's history, all right? So, come on, know, if the truth are being known, God has been protecting us in ways beyond our wildest uh, imagination. So next is a staff, the shepherd's staff that comforted David. What is a staff? Look up, it is a uh, long stake with a curve. Now, what is a youth as, as a staff? It is to lift sheep out of the pit. It is to draw sheep under himself. What does it mean practically in our everyday life? When you're going through perhaps the valley, even if you make a bad choice, man, God wants you not to run away from him. God wants you to come near to him. With his shepherd's staff, he will draw you to him. So when you're in the valley situation. Your priority is not to get, God, I want solution to this problem. Uh, I want the answer to this uh, question. Your greatest priority is not to solve your problem. Your greatest priority is to know your shepherd. Because when you know him, he's going to take you out. Isaiah 41 verse 10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Wow. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. The presence of the shepherd. Uh, the NLT is one of the best translations. But um, in this instance, it was like a watered-down translation of the original Hebrew. Isaiah 41, reading from the uh, Rotherham's translation, really bring out the meaning of this uh, passage in the original Hebrew. Do not fear, for with thee I am. Oh. That's old English, huh? With the I am. You know, sometimes when you translate uh, English people, English experts, they try to make things, everything smooth, but you lost the um. Huh? And where it is lost is here. Where NLT say, don't be discouraged. The real Hebrew says, look not around. Say, look not around. Yeah, don't get discouraged. But it, 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 it really uh, didn't bring up the revelation. You know, Hamram is though, here is a powerful Revelation and truth. How to come out of the valley? Look not around. Say, look not around. And when you don't look around, I have emboldened you. Again, I said this all in English, but you know, it really brings up the Hebrew. God says He will give you bonus. Now we hear preachers say, oh, you're going to be bold, but how do you get that bonus? from inside out. See, true bonus is not about screaming and shouting. I don't understand sometimes why even with the mic, some people just still shout. <laughs> it is not human strength. It's not human volume. All right, how do we become bold, taking on uh, the challenges that we are in? The answer is when we look not around. Say, look not around. Pastor, well, so how do I look around? When you look around for human being to applause you, to congratulate you, to pat you on the back, and they say, man, you're cool, man, you're okay, man. Now, if you look for a human being to applause you, you're going to be frustrated most of the time. That's what Jesus Christ experienced. Remember the Golden Gate was marching into the holy city? The crowds of people were screaming, Hosanna! Hosanna to God in the highest. Just four days later, another crowd, maybe some people from that same crowd, Say, crucify him, crucify him. If you look for a human being to applause you, you're going to be disappointed. God say, look not around. Look to him. You know what the Father say? I love you with an everlasting love. Look for God's applause, not human applause and other people say. You know, sometimes you see beautiful girls because they come from a family that they, they don't feel that love maybe mom and dad have too many children they don't get the attention maybe dad is uh, quite a harsh person always putting her down especially we in the asian family if you're a girl you're second class we even got a term sit bun for non-profit entity liability and they don't really understand while why some preacher like to prophesy you're going to have a boy? To me, what difference does it make? 
And uh, you know, we grew up in situation like this. Sometimes we we felt miserable. We don't have a sense of worth, and as a result, we give in to temptation. Any jerk come to give you a semblance of love, you just give yourself to him, and you become more miserable. You know why? You're looking to a human being. To satisfy your deepest need, the Bible say, "Look not around." When you look not around, Hamram must know you're going to be emboldened to fulfill your highest destiny. Don't look around looking for people to change, to make you happy. Pastor, if only my husband do this for me, if only my staff a little bit more <laughs> alert. Pastor, if only my boss give me double increase. If only. And we are praying all the time, God. If you change them, I gotta be happy. Man, let me tell you this: when you do that, you gotta be frustrated. Realize that no matter what you do, there are some people they will still not be for you. Now, of course, we pray for them, but sometimes, no matter what you do, they will never be for you. Even loved one, they will not be for you. But what does it show? It simply shows. That they are not part of your destiny, but I have good news for you. When you look up, don't look around. Look at Him. God has already lined up the right people for you, and other people say, and who will encourage you and who will lift you up. Don't look around at the circumstances. Don't allow the traffic today cause you to suffer the rest of the day. Don't let what people say cause you to suffer. Look up to Him. And man, when you look up to him, that's going to be that power from within out. You got to be emboldened, and other people say, you know, when you're being emboldened, you are actually fulfilling your highest destiny, the original destiny. Remember when God put Adam in the Garden of Eden? You know what He said, Genesis one twenty-eight. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, "Be fruitful and multiply." Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You know, when we are being emboldened, we are able to rise up to the destiny to dominate the earth, to subdue the earth. Something that Adam lost because he chose not to have the presence of God in his life. That's the reason why. How do we get emboldened? Number one, look not around. Look up to Him. You you see this dominating trend, even in kids, from young kids grew up. Just like my grandchild David, I want to see the moon. So I take him, uh, see the moon. Then I say, you want to go to the moon? Then no, no, no. Yeah. Oh, I, I want to drive car. So I had to bring him to my car, and he he will be. You know what? He's just exerting. His rightful dominance. I want to eat dark chocolate. Let's go to my office and just pull over the fridge without asking permission. He is bold. He is emboldened. <laughs> I just want to go for the dark chocolate. Sometimes we parents are alarmed. Oh, I want this. I want that. Of course, we got to guide them in the right direction. But you know that this is but a manifestation of the calling. Two things. Number one, subdue. What is subdue? It is to put pieces together when there is chaos, when there is confusion. That's what happened Genesis one, and the darkness was over the surface of the deep. There was chaos, there was war, there was confusion. But God says, "Let there be light," and there was light. God subdued it. In other words, maybe in your office there may be people that is causing all kind of problem. Get a rise up, be emboldened. To subdue all the confusion, all the darkness,、uh, and dominate. What do you mean by dominate? It means to rule. How many of us know God wants to embolden you to rule in the midst of your enemy? And but how do I do it? You don't need to scream. Some people they they, they think means oh when they pray they gotta shout and scream. Now, only in the parade ground, the sergeant major. We have to shout and scream. Stop! That's the voice of the sergeant major. If you, the king, 
or the president will just stand behind the podium and just speak, and that is law. So the semi humble ones know you don't have to raise your voice. When you go to grottoes, you don't have to raise your voice. <laughs> don't become a sergeant major. Raise your voice. All right. All you need to do is to declare and to speak. One of the most powerful way for us to be emboldened, to dominate, to subdue, is to pray the Lord's prayer. Thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory. You don't have to raise your voice. Just say, Lord. I declare your kingdom come into my business. Your kingdom come, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Then you apply the blood of Jesus over your pathway, and then you declare God's shalom. Now you know we have trips every month. Okay, so every day, almost every day, we pray. God, I declare shalom and profuse favor during. And after, before, all our trips. All right, I, I learned to, you know, we, uh, to do that over the years. Every day, I pray for you. Every day, I pray for my staff. God, grant them shalom, grant them profuse favor. And man, I see God working in ways that is astounding. The key thing is, like a just like the earthly monarch, he doesn't have to scream, to shout command. All he need to do is to stand there. With his authority and decrees, and how many of us know God has given us that authority? How do we get emboldened? How do we get that authority when we look not around? Say, look not around. And、um, yeah, one of the things we always do <laughs> is when we start to drive our car to exert our dominance in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind every spirit of accidents. Deliver me from human errors and every form of errors, and、uh, and you're exerting dominance in a way that, as a king and a priest, that God has made you to be, and other people say, it's not a human way. It's not raising your voice, trying to shout and scream in your prayers. It's not your amplitude. You need grotto. You don't have to shout. But God is not deaf. I never say amen to that. But when you Exert your dominance the right way. When you guide your children, exert their natural、uh, tendency to be emboldened to command. Don't stifle their desire. I want to do something. You shut them off and say, "Oh, you do this." I, I want to be a model. Ah, <laughs> your model. <laughs> Don't do that. All right. Let them exert their dominance in the right way. Guide them in the right direction. But realize, humble mothers know. That you do have the authority, God-given authority, restoration of that Adamic charge over the earth to take dominance and other people say, "Amen." Wonderful Jesus. In closing, tell you a story. Or、oh, next week, okay? It's a bit late.、Huh? All right. There was this guy who was in a foreign office trying to get a visa. The guy behind the counter was as hot as can be and very harsh. He said, "No, man, you have a backlog of、uh, the job, your visa." Not going to be approved、uh, in five years. Man, he was tempted to just give him a piece of his mind, but he remembered this: that he is a king, not the world way, shouting and screaming like a sergeant major. No, he went back as cool as can be. He de- began to declare favor, began to declare God's authority over the situation. In a few weeks' time, the officer called him, "Come and collect your visa." Huh?、Uh, I thought you did. About five years, I don't know. Something strange about you. After you left me, I cannot take you out of your mind. When I eat, I saw you. When I dream, I saw you. When I drive, I saw you. Take this dot 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 four-letter word visa out of this place and go <laughs> out of my sight. I must know that is to take dominance. You are being emboldened to take dominance, and other people say, but how? When we look not around, the good shepherd is in the valley to take you the right direction. But don't try to sort thing out yourself. Let him sort out all your messes, and all the people say, "Amen." Before we take communion, can I take just a couple of minutes for you to fill up this cup? All right, the prayer saturation. Can remember we told you, all right? Man, I can imagine if intercessors didn't pray for us when we were. 
in Finland preaching. This is at that time that we saw God multiply wine and God multiply bread during the Holy Communion. If the intercessor didn't pray, I, I just wonder what would happen to Lois. She was only primary one. The school bars take off without her. And God just led her to cross the road. Don't even know where Aunt Julie works, but knows that roughly that Aunt Julie works there. And man, I remember though, that is divine protection because intercessors are praying. We need your prayer, all right? But I'm not going. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So would you take a moment, a minute or two, fill up your name, and tell us when you want to pray, what day, what time. And I suggest when you're driving to work, instead of grumbling, watching the news, hearing news, uh, repeat it again and again. Why don't, while you're driving, Lord, I lift up Pastor and the team to you. Help me pray the perfect prayer. That half an hour, the 45 minutes you drive, pray for us in tongues. Just tongues. The perfect prayer. When you're cooking, shoom, your chocolate dough or whatever, or your curry, Lord, I lift up Pastor to you. And you pray in tongues. While you're gardening, while you're doing anything under your breath. You pray in tongues for it. Would you do that whatever day? Okay. The Bible tells us the good shepherd laid down his life for us. The Bible says he himself took our infirmities. By his stripes we were healed. He himself. You know, what Jesus go through just to bring us this amazing restoration. You think of the 39 lashes is like those Jewish lashes, just one cane at a time. Actually, Jesus was flocked, scourged by the Roman soldier. The scourge is not just an ordinary leather strip. It's actually sometimes called the cat of nine lashes. Each of those lashes glued with nails, broken pieces of glass. The soldiers lash it across Jesus' body and pull 39 times. By the time, 39 times or 40. This is why Isaiah 52 tells us he's beyond human recognition. And Jesus, the Messiah's Nick Psalm says, the people stare at my bones. You can't see flesh, just bone. Herman must know he took that trouble, all right, to die for us, for our sin. What is he going to withhold from us and other people say? The good shepherd laid down his life for you. The Lord Jesus Christ said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. This cup, the Lord Jesus Christ said, let's sing this beautiful song, the Lord's Prayer. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 
would you uh, pray this prayer together with me? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for being my good shepherd. Right now, I receive you into my life as my shepherd, as my Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I know even I make bad choices, you are with me, you are for me, and you will sort things out for me because you are the good shepherd who have already laid down your life for me. And all the people say, Amen. Prayer and want to know more or have any feedbacks, please write to us. 